Acts 6. During those days when the disciples were increasing in number, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. And the twelve called together the whole community of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait on tables. Therefore, friends, select from among yourselves seven men of good standing, full of spirit and of wisdom, whom we may appoint to this task, while we, for our part, will devote ourselves to prayer and serving the word. Well, they said, please, the whole community, and they chose Stephen, a man of faith and the Holy Spirit, together with Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenius, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. They had these men stand before the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. The word of God continued to spread. The number of the disciples increased greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Stephen, full of grace and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. The word of the Lord. Well, thanks to the good work of the Schwartz, I was while on vacation, able to enjoy a portion of what y'all experienced last week. I was pleased to uh, watch the whole Lord's Prayer experience. I um, enjoyed that. I uh, thought it was really powerful the way it all came together. And that went so well that I decided I'd watch the sermon. And while I was actually listening to the sermon, I heard Eleanor say that Andy was recording it so that I could see what I had to follow. <laughs> I was on vacation. I didn't need that. I didn't need to hear how effective she was preaching or how comfortable she was in the pulpit. So I'm feeling a little protective of myself. Which is why I brought this for Ellen and all her fan club to see. This is a list of appointments. Right there beside St. James, it's uh, William Francis. I love this <laughs> Just want you to know that, Ellen. Um, <laughs> seriously, I'm very pleased and thankful for how you led so well and what you had to say and, and everybody's participation. I, mean, I was very impressed. One of the things that, that Eleanor focused on and I, I thought was great was how she sensed that the... Um, the Holy Spirit empowers all of us to do different things for the sake of God's kingdom. That, that she called that vision of Pentecost, that Pentecost means that does, God doesn't just come across some people to do certain things. God comes upon all baptized Christians to lead them into ways of, of ministry, of service. And, and she listed for us various examples, um, and regular things that we can do because of God's Holy Spirit moving among us, and that because of God's Spirit, these become powerful gifts from God to the kingdom of God, to help bring about the kingdom of God. So, you know, I thought she, in doing that, spoke well of what the meaning of Pentecost is. The book of Acts speaks of that. The book of Acts, uh, throughout, it talks of the Holy Spirit coming upon these ordinary people and, and changing their lives into extraordinary works for God. God comes across people like Stephen, we just read, and all those other people, and God moves them in ways that, that they might not have ever anticipated before. I, in reading that first part from Acts 6, I just introduced you to Stephen, whose, whose credentials were he was full of faith, full of grace, full of power. He was empowered to wait on tables. Here, here's a church member. He never knew Jesus personally. He, he hadn't gone to any training. He was a church member who the Holy Spirit got a hold of, and he said, if there's a need, I'll help out. That was Stephen. Stephen was, was among this group, and the apostles were, were doing their work, and, and their work was narrow in focus. They, they said they were to be dedicated to prayer, and they were to be de dedicated to the Word of God, to, to learning the Word of God, to hearing the Word of God, to sharing the Word of God, interpreting the Word of God, and that was their focus. And while they saw other needs among them, their attention was given to these two things. 
but the Hellenists, as they called it, the Greeks among them said, well, hang on a second. We, we've said as one of our core values, as this group of people, these people who follow Jesus, one of our core values is that when there are needs, we will contribute to take care of needs. There will be no needs among us. We will give all we have to make sure there is no one in need. And here is this group of widows who's hungry. Here is this group of widows who doesn't have enough to eat. And Stephen and others were called up to say, hey, you take care of this. You fix the food. You wait on the table so that there won't be need among us. And Stephen said, I, I can do that. A church member who said, I can do that. So we, uh, we follow Stephen's story then. And Stephen's become kind of this symbol of, of lay ministers, of, of church members doing what uh, needs to be done for the sake of the kingdom. When I was first appointed to Central in Florence, um, after my first summer of it, a group of lay people, five church members and me, we went up to Philadelphia to get trained for something called Stephen Leaders Training. And the whole idea for this is that we would come back and implement the program at the church and uh, train church members to become what's called Stephen Ministers, based on this guy, Stephen. The job of Stephen Minister is to to fill in the gaps um, that are going to be there in care for congregation members. It recognizes that grief does not just go on for a week. That the death and the funeral is not the whole of a person's grief. It's just the beginning place. And so uh, it, it brings along people who are going to be able to be with, with the bereaved for, for months, for up to a year. And if their need continues, another Stephen minister come in for, for a longer period. Or maybe somebody's going through a major life transition and they need somebody to help walk with them through that. Or maybe their job has been lost. Or, or maybe their child has gone off to school or whatever. You know, a Stephen minister can be there to see them through these, these major shifts in life. So we went up there, got trained, came back and started the program. Well, one of the uh, persons who went to get trained as a Stephen leader uh, wanted her sons, who were then teenagers, to have a sense of why, where this name Stephen lit ministry came from. She wanted to help them get the biblical context. So she pulls out Acts 6 and she starts reading what I just read. Um, it sounded good, you know, full of grace, and truth, and power. Stephen was able to do many signs and wonders and the boys were all impressed. She kept reading. She was an attorney and very thorough, and she wanted to read the whole thing. She wanted the, the whole scope of Stephen's life, so she didn't stop. It's full of grace and, and truth and power and signs and wonders. She kept reading, and the more she did, the bigger her eyes, her son's eyes got. They uh, didn't exactly like the way the story went. She read on and told them she'd been... Become, was, had become a Stephen minister to do the things uh, that this guy, Stephen, had done. And, and she kept reading. And she read about this confrontation between Stephen and the leaders of the council and, and how they were at odds and how the leaders of the council couldn't win an argument against Stephen. So they came up with all kinds of charges that he had blasphemed against God. And they bring him up to the, to the rest of the council. And they bring him to the high priest. And they want him charged. And they, the high priest gives him a chance to defend himself. And and he didn't have a good lawyer. He didn't know how to speak half-truths or obscured truths or just enough truth to not get yourself hung. He, he said it all. And through this whole Acts 6 and 7, we get a sermon from Stephen. And he interprets the scriptures as he understands and he speaks of the great fathers of the faith. And he finally comes to Solomon and he says, In this great house where you think Solomon lived, God lives, and God doesn't live here, he's now talking bad about the temple. He goes on to say this, Acts 7, 48. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made with human hands. As the prophet says, human, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did my hands make not make all these things? 
and then unable or unwilling to control himself. Maybe the spirit had control. Stephen goes on to interpret what he had to say about this whole thing. This is what he tells those people, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears. You are forever opposing the Holy Spirit, just as your ancestors used to do. Which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, and now you have become his betrayers and murderers. You are the ones that receive the law as ordained by angels, and yet you have not kept it. This is why preachers are careful about who we invite into the pulpit. <laughs> They can be a common danger to themselves. I'm glad Eleanor didn't interpret the scriptures this way that last week because look how those who heard it, how the congregation responded to the word of the Lord. When they heard these things, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So they covered their ears. And with a loud shout, all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died, and Saul approved of their killing him. The word of the Lord. You see now when my friend's son's uh, eyes grew a little larger, you can see as the story went on why they were a little less uh, thrilled with the idea of their mother becoming a Stephen minister. Mom, you're a, a good lawyer. Keep doing that. Aren't you happy with that? We can put up with those lame lawyer jokes. Keep lawyering. Didn't you read the whole story before you signed up for this? She had. She knew the whole story. She knew that her work as a Stephen minister, her work assisting people in times of crisis would be more like the beginning of Acts 6 and most assuredly would not end up the way Stephen spiked. She knew it would be more along the lines of coming along somebody in a time of need and providing for them what they might could use in a friend. But she knew something else. She knew the calling to emulate calling to do as faithful people had done. And she knew that this was her latest attempt to do that. To follow the way Stephen had followed Christ. This is Father's Day, so I'll tell y'all that I uh, love being a father. Some days it's tough, but I love it. In no small part, I love it because my children still like me. <laughs> and some days they even adore me. And I like that. I encourage it. I think more people should adore me. <laughs> so we were uh, at the beach, and it being Father's Day, uh, or coming up, Mac decided if I needed a new shirt. And not just any new shirt. He took his mother and they found a shirt that looks like a shirt he has. He's still young enough to want to dress alike, and I'm game as long as he is. So they have a shirt waiting for me. They're, it's Father's Day, and they adore me, but they adore their cousin more, so they're not here to celebrate. <laughs> They've gone to my niece's baptism.